I am thrilled that you're here, having had the privilege of working with you when you were uh, with U.S. Agency for International Development, and now you're at the World Bank, and I know you've had several stints there, and maybe what would be um, helpful and useful is if you could speak a little bit to your career path as somebody who's really been working on disability inclusion and at the forefront of issues related to um, inclusion and rights for a long time, because uh, it's an area often that um, people don't think about as a really critical part of the um, development agenda. Thanks, Carla, and thank you so much for having me. It's it's really great to be able to reconnect with you again and, and talk to you about um, such an important issue. So, you know, my career started off um, with a lot of interest on issues related to, to social justice. Um, and, you know, and part of it, part of it had to do from a very, came from a very personal space. Um, my father is white, he's from Indiana. My mom is black, she's from Cape Town, just in, in South Africa. And they were married during the time when it was illegal for um, intermarriage to happen in, in certainly in South Africa and perhaps not too favorable in places like Indiana at the time. Um, and so I always grew up with this very strong sense of justice and was very acutely aware of discrimination and what the consequences of discrimination were. And so from very early on, I knew that I wanted to, to study law um, and I wanted to study international law at work in the public domain. And so human rights was, was the best fit for me. Um, and, and that's what I went on to do. I, I studied human rights law and, um, and then was very fortunate straight after the law school to get a job in South Africa with a policy think tank that was attached to a university in Cape Town. And there I was responsible for working on children's rights, um, which was fantastic. It was a very exciting time in South Africa. It was during the development of the constitution. And so we were able to be directly involved as a, as a policy team in, in recommendations for language to the constitution itself. South Africa's constitution ended up being one of the most progressive constitutions in the world, including economic and social rights, including um, the, the recognition of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, it was a, is a constitution that recognized the rights of persons with disabilities. And, and I think this is because there was very much an activist approach to developing the constitution itself. I then went to work um, for UNICEF um, and, and was really intrigued by the international space. At the time I was working primarily on the continent, so working in Africa and providing advice on child protection issues across, across the Africa region. And you know, at the time I was very interested in disability rights, but I didn't want to fo focus exclusively on disability. I wanted to have a broader sense of the rights agenda um, and see where, where, where that took me. And so for a couple of years, I worked with UNICEF and then I went on um, to work for the South African Human Rights Commission. And there I was responsible for economic and social rights. And my particular interest at that stage was the right to food. And so I worked a lot in that space, but I had this niggling feeling around, as you were saying, there was this part that this part of the rights agenda that just really wasn't getting any traction and that was disability rights. Um, and as a person with a disability myself, I thought, well, you know, I'm really well situated to begin to address this. And so I started to increasingly work in the space of disability rights, but always trying to bring it into the mainstream human rights discussions, right? So whether it was the right to food, I would think about what does this mean for persons with disabilities or whether I was working on children, what does this mean for children with disabilities and address the disproportional impact that it had on persons with disabilities? Um, and then I decided at some stage, you know, this was exciting work, but I really wanted to go um, and see the world a bit more and, 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 and so decided to join the World Bank. 
And so I worked with the World Bank for a bit, working in East Asia and the Pacific region, a region that was very new to me, so extremely exciting at the time, um, and working within the human development sector. And so I was working on a lot of education projects and within those projects, trying to find entry points for disability inclusion, similarly for health and, 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 social, and social protection. And then in 2010, as you know, I joined USAID as a political appointee to lead the work on disability inclusion within, the, within USAID. And I was attached to the policy planning and learning part of USAID. Um, and that was also extremely exciting because you know, USAID had actually was at the forefront in terms of bilateral donors in driving the disability agenda. They had had a policy in place way before any other donors. And there was a very keen sense that this was an important aspect of the work we were doing, a recognition that it was part of the development package. Um, and, and so, you know, I think the time at USAID was, was, was a very good time. And I, we were able to find ways to to make sure that it's stuck, right? Because that's been one of the issues around these agendas that they come in and they, and, you know, they, they they kind of ebb and flow. And so it was important to anchor this agenda within policies, anchor it amongst other colleagues. And, and I feel that aid has really taken that on and continues to do really good work on, on disability inclusion, including you know, aspects around um, supporting organizations or persons with disabilities. And then I returned back to the World Bank um, and took on the position of global disability advisor. And, you know, that work really is um, focused on ensuring that disability is included in World Bank policies, practices, and, and projects. And that looks very different depending on, on the day. And we can talk about that in a bit. That's great. It's super interesting. I, I want to pick up on that thread, that sort of what have you seen when you've looked at issues related to disability inclusion in countries around the world? Sort of what do you see as the, the sweet spot where there's movement? And what do you see as the places where it's the most challenging? And yeah. you know, we were talking before we started about the travel you're on now. I mean, that's a perfect example. Yeah. So look, I think the sweet spot um, is very much about having in place strong enabling legislation or policy frameworks, right? And I think um, the US is, is, a, is a, good, um, a good example of that. Um, in 1990, we had the Americans with Disabilities Act, which essentially is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of, um, dis on, on discrimination on the basis of disability and actually speaks specifically in Title I to, to employment and the importance of ensuring that persons with disabilities have equal access to employment. Now the ADA has, you know, has some limitations, but it actually is a pretty strong piece of legislation, at least a foundational piece, right? And what I've seen is countries that have strong foundational legislation often are in a better position. Another important kind of galvanizing force has been the entry into force of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And that has now been ratified by 185 countries. So, you know, this makes our work slightly easier because most of the countries that we work with through the bank have ratified the convention. And that means they have undertaken to fulfill a host of rights and the rights in the convention are include principles, but they also include a, a number of substantive rights that, that really straddle the entirety of a person's, um, a, a person's life, right? So it's from early education to um, living in the community and, and a lot in between that. And so the convention has been very important in terms of giving visibility to disability rights. Um, and, you know, disability rights were included in some of the other conventions. The, it, you know, disability was included in the Convention on, uh, um, on Child Rights, albeit a, a small little article, but it was included. So I think this recognition, finally, that disability rights are human rights has been really important. 
And I think what it does, what, what the convention does is it provides that sweet spot, both in terms of the duty bearer, but also in terms of the rights holders, right? And we've seen that it's been instrumental in giving, in boosting the work of organizations of persons with disabilities, because now they have a document that sets out their rights and requires government to, to act on them. And, and, these, and, and the implementation of the convention is monitored and observations are made. So, you know, there's a whole mechanism to ensure that there is implementation. And so, you know, in countries that I travel to just more recently, Uzbekistan, you see that there's been A, ratification of the convention, B, they've put in place domestic legislation and policies to support um, implementation at, 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 at domestic level. But what's also very necessary is to ensure that you have organized um, organizations of persons with disabilities, that voice that can then hold government accountable to ensure that the rights are in fact met. Because it's one thing to have good legislation, it's another thing to have implementation and have services on the ground so people can benefit alongside their non-disabled peers. That's super helpful. I, I, maybe I should have asked this first, but I would love if you could just give a little bit of context to folks who are here. You know, what is the magnitude of the challenge? How are, how many people are there with disabilities and what's the degree of, or, or the extent of Im impediments that they face. Yeah. Um, I think that would be super helpful and interesting for people. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the population is about 1 billion people or 15% of the world's population. And in my view, that's probably an undercount. Um, that number comes out of a World Bank and WHO report that was done in 2011. You know, I think one of the issues that we found is that um, there's often a very narrow understanding of disability. And so when people talk about the 15% or the 1 billion people, they're often talking about people who have visible disabilities, right? So disabilities that are easy to see. Often they're not talking about people with invisible disabilities. And we know that there are hundreds of millions of people that have invisible disabilities. And those could range from mental health issues to chronic illness, um, intellectual disabilities, and so forth. Um, it could also, and, and so we often, those, those types of disabilities are often not picked up, particularly in the global south, where the focus still is very much on the type, the traditional disabilities like blindness, deafness, physical disability, um, and sometimes multiple disabilities. And so there's increasingly a, a move internationally and the World Bank is supporting a lot of this work to have better disability disaggregated data. Because as an institution that's an evidence-based institution, we need to have the data to inform our projects and, and our investments. And, and so we're doing that in a number of ways. One way is to ensure that within censuses, we have better questions on disability. Uh, another way is to make sure that uh, for administrative data, like say the education management information systems collect more nuanced data on children with disabilities so that we have a better sense of what the numbers are, right? Interestingly, the data tells us that more women have disabilities than men globally, um, and that more that 80% of persons with disabilities live in, in developing countries. And so therein, there is a challenge and how do we ensure that, that you know, we are addressing their needs and ensuring that they have access to services um, that are appropriate for them. So, you know, I think um, what's, what's also very often the case is that people with disabilities are just not being counted. Uh, and so there, I, there's clearly a need to do more around having better data um, and, then, and then looking at it in a disaggregated way. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, I know, you know, picking up on that data and thinking about it within the scope for students of where you, where you go with a focus on inclusion and how you move in your career, I know that there are 
also subfields related to disability inclusion, for example, war victims um, and the rights of veterans with, with um, uh, disabilities or impairment. Could you maybe talk about that a little bit in terms of the professional field, how, how people work in these different subfields and, yeah. and what it means to sort of advance a career in this area? Yeah, so look, I mean, I think that's that's a great question, Carla. And you know, there there are many subfields, right? And you you pointed out a few. Um, I mean, one for me has been very much uh, children with disabilities and the educate and access to inclusive education for children with disabilities. That's in and of itself become an entire stream of work, right? And you have organizations like UNICEF that are focused. Um, very heavily on inclusive education. Uh, UNESCO focused on that. Uh, the Global Partnership for Education has a, a keen interest on inclusive education, as does the bank. So we're beginning to see, I would say, a more professionalization of these various streams, right? And that's because, you know, you can have the general sense of what inclusion means, but then it does get technical, right? You need to understand what do you, what do teachers need in order to teach kids with certain types of disabilities? And that requires some, some technical expertise. Uh, same with health, same with, you know, social protection. Um, and then there are other, there are other themes like um, women with disabilities, right? And, and that has an article, a standalone article in the convention. And women with disabilities are employed low, are employed at lower rates than men with disabilities, right? And we begin to see that gendered aspect play out amongst women with disabilities themselves. That there's also a keen interest now in looking at that intersectional aspect, the intersectionality of disability and gender, and how women with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by discrimination, by stigma, by social norms, and by exclusion writ large. Um, and so, you know, what's exciting about this space in terms of a career is that you could be interested in um, technology and find resonance in, in this in this space. You know, this, this is a growing space. There are lots of people who are working on ICT and disability. There are loads of people that are working on monitoring disability rights. Um, how do you ensure that financial inclusion is reaching to reaching to persons with disabilities in, 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 in developing countries? So, you know, employment is a very, very big space in, in the disability discussions. And so it's really about finding your area of interest and then matching it to the disability sector. And what I find really interesting in this is that, you know, disability is often a is often a wedge issue that you can bring to governments and say, look, we can talk to you about disability um, and disability rights. And usually they're not going to say, this is too political. This is not something we want to discuss, unlike some of the other sectors, right? And what I think that that, that allows us to do is to seed ideas around accountability, um, seed ideas around voice, seed ideas around participation with groups that have been very excluded that then in part help develop more of a democratic understanding in, in particular contexts. So it's been fascinating to see how disability is often you know, a lever to, to discussing broader democratic issues and, and access issues writ large. It's really interesting that that idea that this is a sort of less controversial area that allows you entree to a whole range of of different issues around inclusion. I'm building on that. I'm curious for those who are interested in advancing this agenda, but perhaps not focusing on it as as the center of their career. Kind of what would you say are the ways that people can work towards inclusion? Um, as part of a portfolio of work that may be either broader or focused elsewhere? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there are two, there are two streams. There's the domestic stream. So, you know, looking at what's happening in the States and working with organizations that work on this um, 
in DC, there's the, the US Council for, Dis for, for US International Council for Disability, and they do a lot of policy work internationally, um, but it, it, it is a US based um, organization. And then, of course, there are lots of you know, state run organizations and, and groups that work on disability inclusion. And then internationally, which is the space that I work in, there's, there's a lot of interest. You've got a huge number of um, INGOs and, and NGOs that work in the space of disability. Um, Interaction is a good place to start in the US. They have a disability working group and it brings together all the different international agencies that are based in, in DC working on disability. So that's an interesting place to, to work um, or to, to, to explore. And, you know, I mean, I think if somebody is really interested in, in thinking about disability inclusion and disability rights, I would say, pick up a copy of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, because it gives you a really good sense of what the roadmap looks like for disability inclusion. And then if I may say, the World Bank has also developed um, a vast number of, of documents, um, and I think some very instructive pieces on, on, on the importance of thinking about disability inclusion as a development issue, and centered that within the World Bank's work and more globally. And so we have a, an external website that has a lot of resources on it, and I would encourage those of you who are interested to check that out. Um, and you know, Carla, I'm always willing to have a chat with people who are interested, and and discuss you know with them personally how how they might want to advance this agenda. But it it really is an exciting space, and it's a space that's growing. And it's as I said earlier on, it's becoming more technical, um, and I think we're beginning to see it more as something that people are investing in as a profession. So it's not something you just do by happenstance. It's there's a whole science that, you know, and a discipline that 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 comes with disability inclusion today. That's great. I have two more quick questions, and then I want to open it up for um, questions and discussion from folks who are uh, with us. So prepare your questions. Um, the the first is you mentioned that you were trained as a lawyer and um, and that that was sort of where you started. And I'm curious if you could think a little bit about, you know, did that serve you looking back, would there have been another degree or path to the work that you're doing? You know, talk a little bit about that, sort of how the education served you and how it was formative to your work in this area. Yeah, so I mean, I don't think I would have done anything different. I think I always wanted to be a lawyer and I think I'm happy that I chose that, that, that course of um, study. And I think what it did for me was give me a foundation in understanding um, discrimination and, 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 and how the law, in, in, the case, in my case, how the law can be used for social good, right? And, and I think that that's been fundamental for me going forward. I always, you know, I always go back to, oh, well, let's look at the legislative framework. Um, and, and I think that that's been, that's, yeah, I don't think I would have changed that. That said, I do have on my team colleagues that have backgrounds in education, colleagues that have backgrounds in um, civil engineering, um, you know, colleagues who have a background in gender studies or in um, international development. So it really is, is quite vast, the space that you can come from because the, the agenda, the disability agenda itself is so large, right? It covers so many different um, so many different areas. Um, so I think it's just about finding your own sweet spot and 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 going after that. Um, you know, I was also, no, I don't think I would have changed my law degree, Carla. I was just thinking, you know, having participated in the, the negotiations around the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I mean, that was kind of a highlight for me. And you know, to, to have been able to study it and then be at the UN in the room with all the state part, with all the with all the governments actually negotiating the treaty was was really quite sensational. And then to see it come to fruition, right? To actually see it implemented. And and again, just my recent travel in Uzbekistan, everywhere you go, organizations of persons with disabilities are talking about the convention. 
And I'm thinking, you know, it's not even 20 years ago that we were negotiating this. And so it's it just shows how things can, you know, how these documents do in fact have a life and that they do impact people's lives on the ground. And so they're not just um, words on paper, as I often hear people say. It's really, it's interesting also, I mean, I think you also highlighted earlier the connection to the constitution in South Africa and, and the way that your law background sort of enabled you to be in these rooms that were particularly sort of legal framework oriented yeah. um, is interesting. I, I wonder if you could, and this is the last question and then I'm gonna open it up, um, talk a little bit about how a focus on disability inclusion makes its way into World Bank programs. I mean, you talked a little bit about materials and analytic um, documents that are there, but I, you know, there's also obviously the World Bank is a bank and there's a whole set of loan portfolios. So yeah. talk a little bit about how it's how it's both how it's both mainstreamed and a focus of work within the bank so that people can understand a little bit about how that how that works. So it's been it's been a process for sure. Um, and, you know, the bank started to think about disability some 20 years ago. But again, it ebbed and flowed. They had people, they, you know, they had a coordinator, they had an advisor, um, there were some resources and then there weren't resources. But I think what's happened in the last, say, eight, nine years has been, again, strong policies in place. We have the environmental social framework, which is a set of 10 standards um, that address a range of issues related to disability. So there's a standard on that uh, a standard on non a principle on non-discrimination um, and, 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 and disability is linked to that. Disability is linked to one of the standards on universal access. So ensuring that people have access to anything that's built, financed by the bank. And then there's also a standard that talk that talks about the importance of stakeholder engagement. And within that, there's a subtext that says um, stakeholder engagement needs to take into account accessibility and other formats to ensure that persons with disabilities can participate. So once these standards were put in place, it's incumbent on task team leaders who, who lead projects to think about what this means. So we now need to do assessments before we do any lending to see, are we addressing gender? Are we addressing disability? Are we addressing um, SOGI related issues? Are we addressing indigenous persons? And so this has given a big boost to the disability agenda to have these triggers almost within our own frameworks to address disability. We then supplement that um, those, those standards with, um, with the analytical work so that people understand what this actually means in practice. An important piece of, of advancing this agenda in the bank has been training bank staff on disability inclusion and what that might look like in a transportation project or what that might look like in a, an urban development project. Because again, it's going to be very diff di different, but it's about building that body of knowledge so colleagues feel confident that they can take it forward. And so I have a, I have a, a, a small team within the bank that's focused on disability inclusion, and we provide support across the institution um, on various on various parts of of the disability agenda. It could be um, technology and disability, water and disability, and ensuring that World Bank water pro projects are inclusive of persons with disabilities. And what that means is you're working with a task team leader on a project to say look, these are some of the indicators you need to build into your project to ensure that persons with disabilities have access. And it has to be, it has to be explicit and it has to be, it has to be stated very deliberately in the documents. Otherwise, if you just wrap it up into the marginalized or excluded groups, then you don't address the nuanced aspects that are needed for, for, for disability. So we do a lot of that work. We also have, um, we've had some funds that uh, my team manages that's been used to kind of show demonstrative projects, right? Where, where we're kind of starting a new area, we're not too sure 
will support some work and then and then move it to scale. And the idea really is to, to, to take what we call a twin track approach, where we are continuing to support disability explicit work, but ultimately the goal is to mainstream. And so the idea is how, how do you then, how, how do you kind of bring the, how do you converge these two tracks so that mainstreaming does in fact happen? I mean, I, I think it would be, I, I don't think we can say that we're there yet. Um, we certainly haven't mainstreamed disability across World Bank projects, but we're beginning to see a lot of um, progress in relation to disability being included in bank finance projects. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's that's a far, far cry from where we were even five years ago. That's a great summary of sort of how this works um, within the bank. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to turn it to folks who have joined us for their comments and questions. And I can keep going because I love talking to Charlotte. But um, but please, uh, if you want to identify yourself and ask a question, um, we would love that. Um, so you know, feel free to speak up anything related to the field, the um, Charlotte's career uh, work around uh, this area. I'll just keep going if you don't have anything you want to ask. Lindsay. I can, can open this up with the original first question. Sorry, oh, sorry, is that Carmen? Were you speaking? Lindsay can go ahead. I was going to ask oh. a question, but you can go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, Lindsay. Okay, all good. Yeah, Carmen, you could ask a question after me. Um, yeah, I am Lindsay, pronouns they, she. Um, and thank you so much for speaking with us. Like, I'm someone, I'm a graduate student. Uh, in my second year at Georgetown, and I've been really interested in disability for a long time, um, and my partner is actually a disability advocate, and so thank you so much for speaking with us today. I think like one of the, I have like many questions going through my mind, but maybe the first uh, that I'll ask is um, what skills and like capacities do you think it would be most useful for people trying to enter the like disability sphere, I'm interested in like how dis like disability fits into DEI conversations specifically. Um, yeah, I think that's the first one that comes to mind. I had a second part as well. Um, and yeah, I think maybe second part is like, how can we move from like a deficit, like focused conversation, like with people asking what are, how are dis disabled people impaired and how can we move to more of an agency focused one and strengths instead? Great questions, Lindsay, really great questions. So um, on the skills and capacity to, to enter the space of the, of the um, DEI conversation, I would say, you know, having some understanding of um, human resources is really important. Having some understanding of labor laws is really important. Um, because that is, a, you know, that's often a discussion that's being held in that space. But then I think really understanding disability rights is very important because, you know, there are lots of DEI people who are working on the gender piece, on, um, on the race piece, but there are not that many people working in the disability space. And so having a good grasp of disability rights, disability law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, if you want to work locally, would be very important, I think, it, 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 um, to, to, to address that. Um, and then, you know, thanks for, for mentioning the de deficiency model, because it's interesting, that's very much the model that's be, that was used um, in, in a large part um, during the Soviet times, right? It was very much seen as disability, seen as, def it was called defectology, in fact. And so they're moving away from that deficit model or the defectology model, um, which was often very medicalized to a more social model of disability. And the social model of disabilities is, is, is very much about empowering persons with disabilities to have voice. It's about recognizing that it's not my diagnosis that matters, but rather whether I have access, in my case, I use a wheelchair, whether I have access to a building, 
if I have access to a building, then it doesn't really matter what my diagnosis is, right? Um, and so this, there's this great, there's this big paradigm shift to move away from the medical model to a social model that's more empowering, that recognizes that, you know, the exclusion happens where the, the nest, where the, the specific needs are not met. That's where the exclusion happens. Of course, there's the whole issue around stigma and discrimination, which often overlays that, right? And, and that can't be underestimated, the, 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 the strength of um, exclusionary norms and standards really plays a role in how persons with disabilities um, are, are treated in, in, society, in society, even if the society itself is very accessible. So there are lots of pieces that need to come together to ensure that there's a seamlessness um, in place. That's great. I, I would add, Lindsay, just I think the other question is how you can create intersectional identities. So how do you how do you weave a focus on um, in disability inclusion into work you're doing on uh, inclusion of groups, whether that's inclusion of women, LGBTQ plus yeah. communities, um, people of color, indigenous groups, et cetera. And if you often when you look at the data, the, the folks who are facing disabilities and are also in other groups that are typically marginalized. The, the data is even more severe in terms of their marginalization. So it becomes really important to, to look at those intersections. Um, did you have another question, Lindsay, or should I turn to Carmen? You can turn to Carmen now, thank you. Okay. Great, Carmen, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, so my question pertains to, um, we just started a disability ERG uh, here at Georgetown. And so I wanted to know if you, um, at the World Bank or other places, you had experiences with ERGs um, and what you think is, are some of those best practices um, of what the ERG should be doing uh, as a support for the university and for their employees. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good one too. Employee resource groups, yeah? Yeah, so we actually have um, a very active um, employment resource group at the bank. It's called DARE. Um, it's called the Disability Advocacy Resource Employers Group, essentially. And they've been, it is a very, very good group. And what's interesting about the group is that it brings in staff who have disabilities, but also staff who have family members with disabilities, because that has a bearing on a whole host of issues, and um, a significant number of allies, disability allies, um, are, are, are members of, of, of DARE. And it put out the first ever survey on disability at the bank to try and determine what the numbers were in terms of just the staff with disabilities. And that was um, estimated that it was about twelve percent of the of, of the bank staff were were um, had had a disability, and Dare has been instrumental in commenting on a whole host of policies, um, you know, that pertain to human resources. Um, we have a fund at the bank, a disability accommodation fund that supports accommodations for staff with disabilities. DARE has been really at the forefront of making sure that that stays in place and that it does what it's supposed to do. Um, they host often speakers on different aspects of disability, and they really are just a very strong voice um, for disability inclusion within the workplace um, and currently are supporting, uh, supporting the development of the First World Bank disability strategy for bank staff. I mean, we've got we've had a lot of other strategies that are more external facing from our operational work, but we haven't had one uh, for the institution itself. And so DARE has been a very active partner in, in ensuring that that actually speaks to the needs um, of persons with disabilities. So I would say it's been, it, 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 yeah, I mean, I think it's a very active group and, and, and lends itself to being up there as a good practice. That's great, thank you. Um, other questions from folks who are um, listening? Otherwise I can go on with my questions. Uh, 
I'm curious, Charlotte, while others develop their questions, I'm curious what, what you view now as your highest priority for progress, either, you know, personally, professionally, or for the field, sort of what is the next, the next frontier, the next thing, the big, the next thing that we need to overcome in terms of the progress that you've, that you've seen? That's a big question, Carla. Um, so, you know, I think one of the big, the re, really one of the big pieces is to ensure that we don't go into another cycle of ebbing. Um, the last couple of years, the disability agenda internationally received some attention because there were international donors, bilateral donors that were very interested in supporting this work. Um, so UK government was very strong behind this. The Australian government is, was quite strong behind this. Um, US government has been rather consistent, right? It's been consistent in supporting the disability agenda, which is very good. And so I think for me, look, you know, look if you know if I look into um, into a looking glass, uh, I would hope that um, we can begin to ensure that this financing is not dependent on a particular set of priorities of a government, but that it really just becomes part of development. Uh, because you can't, you, it, it's just, it's not, it's not a, it's not a good way to keep on starting and then going back and then you've got a change in government and then they don't think that this is an important agenda anymore. And you lose the traction that you've that that you've advanced um, in eight years. And so I think when if we can get to a space where it becomes part of your mainstream discussions for development, then I think we're in a good space. Uh, and that it's not being it's not seen as an add-on. Uh, or something that you do because there's some additional financing. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be, for me, the big challenge. It's also a difficult time if you look at where we are today in the world. Um, you know, the, the financial landscape is not fantastic. Um, you know, with the war in Ukraine and, and, and a big pivot to climate change, we're seeing resources shifting. Um, but what I'm hoping is that in thinking about climate change, we're also thinking about what does this mean for persons with disabilities? Because we know, and we've done the analytics that persons with disabilities are often disproportionately impacted by natural disasters, right? Just, just one part of that. But that, you know, the climate change broadly, that climate change broadly and climate justice has to include this 15% of the world's population. And so I do, I hope that as these issues, you know, as, as we pivot to, to these important issues, we continue to think about what this means for uh, persons with disabilities. Please go ahead. And if you could introduce yourself. How you guys doing? My name is Roy Henderson. Uh, I'm, I go to Howard University. And, uh, You're okay, even if there's an echo, just speak. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me? Nice to meet you. My name is Roy Henderson. I'm an international business major from Fredericksburg, Virginia. And my question, you kind of, you kind of uh, touched on it. I just kind of want to know the, the more the worldview on disabilities as everything's going on right now, and kind of incorporate the international business aspect to that. So that was kind of my, my question. Great. Question. Yeah. So I mean, I think. You know, it's, I mean, I think, I think just generally, if you look at funding and financing, as I said, you know, it's, it's focused on a couple of things, right? Definitely climate change is, is the big, the big ticket item, um, you know, addressing, addressing um, Ukraine is, 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 is a big ticket item. Um, but I think that, again, the convention, because of its reach, um, has has built up a really large platform and and has brought together organizations that are pushing and driving this agenda internally 
um, that I, I'm very hopeful that it will continue to, 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 to have a salience in, in the work that we do. And then I think at an international level, there are efforts to ensure that disability doesn't fall off the, 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 the development agenda. The World Bank made 10 commitments at a global disability summit. These summits happen every two or three years. Uh, the first one was in London. The second one was during COVID, so it was online, but it was hosted by the government of Norway. The next one will be hosted by the government of Germany and the government of Jordan. And these summits are important because this is a place where everybody comes and makes strong commitments for disability inclusion, um, and, and those are followed up. So, so you know, I think, I think, I think we're going in the right direction. I'm rather impatient. I would like to see it happen much faster. But I also recognize that there are many competing interests um, that are out there. Um, but I do think that within those particular areas of focus, it is important that we insert the disability agenda. So if we're talking about you know, gender-based violence, are we looking at the impact of gender-based violence on women and girls with disabilities? We know that women with disabilities are four times more likely to experience gender-based violence than their non-disabled peers. So you shouldn't have a gender-based violence strategy without including women and girls with disabilities, right? Um, you know, and I think that that needs to be consistent in all of the groups. If we're talking about indigenous people, how are we ensuring that amongst indigenous people that we are addressing indigenous people with disabilities? Um, if we're looking at the LGBTI community, we know that there's an intersectional aspect there and, and how are we addressing that in, within that sector? Um, and so within the bank, the, the advisors for these different, these different um, identity groups work very closely. And we're always trying to find entry points into each other's sectors and making sure that I'm working with the LGBTI plus colleagues and, and LGBTI colleagues are working with the disability piece and making sure that, you know, that intersectional aspect is, 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 is bolstered. Um, and then, you know, I think it's, it's um, incumbent on a new cohort of leaders that are interested in social justice and diversity, um, equity and inclusion to drive this agenda forward. So, you know, it's it's people like you that are going to take on this mantle and ensure that you are addressing equity and, and equality in the workplace, but also in the communities in which we live and work. And I, I really appreciate your answer. And I wonder if you could also, there's an obvious agenda within the private sector for inclusion in the workforce, right? And, and maintaining an ability for people to be included in the workforce. Are there other things that you would advise private and for-profit entities to be focused on? Yeah, I, I think one important thing is to um, hire people who are diverse, right? And I think if you start hiring persons with disabilities into your workspace, that has a profound impact, right? Um, and 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 that 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 I think is is part of the, the 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 diversity, equity, and inclusion piece, right? Making sure that you're not just putting out policies and saying that this is a good thing to do, and and having the accommodations in place, but actually ensuring that you do have staff and business partners. Um, that are persons with disabilities, that if you're looking at procurement processes, you're looking at firms that are owned by persons with disabilities. Um, you know, so I think there are lots of entry points or action points, more than entry points, action points to ensure that you're addressing disability um, in, the pri in the private sector. Thank you. Uh, go ahead with your question. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. perfect. Awesome. My name is Landy Robinson. I am a senior international business major from um, Howard University. Um, I'm, I think my question is regarding, okay, you made a, a fact at the beginning of the um, 
the beginning of the webinar saying about 80% of dis disabled persons are in the developing countries and kind of going back to the worldview international aspect of it. Um, we've been doing a lot of research and we've been watching a lot of webinars about the corruption in governments about um, how, you know, when things come like climate change um, and the different aspects of like uh, trying to implement these policies or developmental aspects into their policies, a lot of that can fall into the place of corruption. And so when you're thinking about trying to fund a go green project in a country that's worrying about poverty or worrying about feeding, getting their next meal, going green is not as important on their list. And I heard you say above, above um, before that you want it to be, you want these things to be more than just a side thought, or you want it to be more than just an afterthought. Like I've talked about, you know, the the gender inequalities, or you know, people getting weaponized, raped, sexually abused, and it being girls and women. But let's also talk about the disabled people in those groups. And so, I guess my question is. When you're thinking about funding these projects in these developing countries, what like protective measures, what hedging, what management measures are you putting in place to make sure that the funds are going to the right people, to the right organizations, to the right groups, so that these things are not just a bystander or just written down in code, but actually not actually, you know, played out in real life? So that's a great question, Landy. And I mean, you know, I think corruption is really something to to keep, a, you know, to be very mi very mindful of. Because it does have, um, it does have a serious impact on a lot, a lot of development. So the way the bank works is that the bank works primarily through through governments, right? So our interlocutors are primarily the ministries of finance, and and then um, other line ministries. So it might be education, it might be the Ministry of Transport, and so forth. And we have some very robust standards in place and mechanisms to ensure that we address aspects related to corruption. Um, we have supervision missions, so bank teams go out, they work with governments, they make sure that the money is going where they say the money is going. We have indicators that show how, and we track the indicators to show the money. You know, if you say you're going to build 220 schools, we make sure that you're building 220 schools and we will check to ensure that you are building 220 schools. Now, that's not to say that corruption never happens because it does, but we do have mechanisms in place to, to address that. Um, but it is, I mean, it's it's been called a cancer of development, right? Um, and, 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 and I think the other part of addressing that is to make sure that you have strong citizen engagement in, in place. And that in the case of disability, you have organizations of persons with disabilities that know that you have an education project that has committed to do X, Y, and Z, and that they can follow up on that, they can track that, they can, you know, they can, they can call it out. Um, I think having a strong media is um, really important because they can play a role, a very important role in uncovering corruption. Um, and again, you know, just making sure that citizens are are engaged. Um, but yeah, and and then obviously having good court systems in place are are is is always helpful. Um, and then I also think training, training, training um, government officials so that they understand the impact of corruption um, and how it plays out in in ordinary people's lives is 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 also very important. So I think there are lots of pieces that need to be put in place to ensure that corruption does not happen. Carla, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the idea that you're holding people accountable or institutions accountable for the commitments they've made under law are really absolutely essential. So I couldn't agree more with the point that you're making. Um, final question before we close off. You mentioned earlier you are a person with a disability, you've had an extraordinary career. What would you say to those who are listening to this conversation is the most important priority for creating space uh, for this agenda for people who face disabilities and, and live with them to move this, this forward and to enable people to thrive um, in workplaces and, and in careers in this area writ large? Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think one of the most important things is about is is around becoming a strong ally. 
And in being an ally, it's about being that person in the room who, when you're having a discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion, say, well, wait a second, are we also talking about persons with disabilities here? Or why aren't we talking about persons with disabilities being that voice where the voice isn't present, right? And, and so that can go a really long way. Um, when somebody else in the room brings it up, makes it an issue, follows up on it. I think also getting some level of understanding about the disability rights discourse was also very helpful. So it helps you kind of root yourself or ground yourself in the knowledge. I mean, you don't have to be a disability expert, but it actually is pretty good to get an understanding of what are some of the issues. Um, and then, I mean, you know, I think for me, it's about being passionate about justice, right? It's ultimately about social justice. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that that's certainly what drives me. It's my passion for ensuring um, justice uh, and ensuring voice and, 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 and equality of opportunity. Um, and there's nothing more gratifying, I think, than doing that. And when you see the breakthroughs, it's really so fabulously sensational to see how you can actually make, you can be instrumental in changing people's lives in a very, very profound way. That's a great final point. And I just wanna thank you so sincerely for joining us this morning and sharing your thoughts and reflections, Charlotte. Wonderful to be with you again. Um, and thanks to those who uh, chose to join us for this great conversation. So have a wonderful week, safe travels back to the United States and talk to you soon. Thanks, Carla. And thanks for all the great questions. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.